In the early 1950s, Harold Alexander, who was a young stonemason living in Hamburg, Germany, came in contact with an old man named George Real. George was the leader of a small religious group called the Lorber Society. This group, which never had a large membership at any point in their short history, was rooted in the Christian faith, but their views were far more extreme than the average Christian congregation. For example, many Christians believe in the concept of self-denial, which in layman's terms means to deny oneself some personal human pleasures, like certain sexual practices or the overindulgence of food or drinking, and all of this is done to gain favor with God. But George and the other members of the Lorber Society took this concept of self-denial to the extreme. They practiced it so aggressively and so literally that nobody in the society could really have a life of their own. All they could do to adhere to their society's very strict rules was to worship God 24-7. In addition to their very severe lifestyles, members of the Lorber Society also believed that anybody outside of their small society was basically evil. So Harold meets George. It's unclear exactly how he meets George, but he does. And immediately Harold is blown away by George. He thinks he's totally incredible. He's so charismatic. And apparently George felt equally highly about Harold. And so right away they have this friendship they strike up and Harold and his wife Dragma, they end up joining the Lorber Society and they completely give themselves over to this very intense lifestyle and they listen to everything George tells them to do. And then very quickly after Harold and his wife had joined this society, their leader George became very ill and it became clear he was going to die soon. When George was on his deathbed, Harold went to visit him, and after speaking with him privately in this room, Harold emerges and he tells his wife that George has told him that he is going to be the next leader of the Lorber Society once George passes away. And so his wife accepts this, as does the rest of the society members, and then after George actually does die, everyone in the society just turns towards Harold and begins listening to him and following him. It's worth noting that we don't know for sure if George really did tell Harold that he was going to be the next leader of the Lorber Society, or if Harold just made that up because he knew George was going to die soon, and he could kind of get away with stealing that title. Over the next few years that Harold was in charge of the Lorber Society, he began introducing a new concept to the members. He would continuously tell them that they needed to be ready for when the next prophet of God returned to the earth. Harold told his members that when this happened, one, Harold would know immediately and he would tell them, and two, whatever this prophet wanted, no matter how confusing or crazy or terrible, they had to do it without question because this was God's will. In 1953, so roughly a year or two after Harold has taken over the Lorber Society, he and his wife, Dragma, have their second child. It's their first boy and they name him Frank. And as soon as this child is born, Harold looks at him and determines that this boy, his son, is the prophet they have all been waiting for. And so he tells his wife and he tells the members of the Lorber Society that his son, Frank, is the prophet of God. And everyone across the board completely accepts it. As the prophet, Frank, grew up, he was shamelessly worshipped and waited on 24-7 by the members of the Lorber Society and his own family. And so naturally, this had a profound impact on the way Frank thought and how he behaved. By the time Frank was at the age of grade school children, he fully believed that he was the prophet of God, and he began using that authority to kind of boss his family around more than he really needed to, especially his three sisters and his mother. But no one ever intervened, because again, this is the prophet of God and he can do whatever he wants. When Frank turned 16, he started thinking about girls and sex, but he was conflicted because he had been taught everybody outside of this society he was a part of were evil. And so he didn't want to pollute himself by having sex with these evil women. And so he went to his father and told him that he wants to start having sex with his mother and his sisters in order to stay pure. And his father, Harold, not only embraced the idea, he encouraged it. And in fact, he would often join in with his son during the sexual intercourse. As for the four Alexander women, they completely accepted their new roles as sexual objects because they believed by doing whatever Frank the prophet wanted, they were serving God. 
Eventually, one of the sisters began talking to some of her very few friends at school about how she was kind of jealous of her other sisters for all the attention they were getting from Frank. And so the friends kind of picked up on this strange relationship between the siblings. And before long, rumors had started about there being some incestuous relations inside of this family. And those rumors eventually made their way to the parents of students. And then from the parents, that made its way to the police. And before long, Harold had discovered that the Hamburg police were about to launch an investigation into his family. And at the same time, Harold also discovered that members of the Lorber Society, they had heard about these incest rumors as well, and they had their own suspicions already, and they were not on board with incest. And so they were very clearly starting to distance themselves from Harold and his family. And so it was pretty clear to Harold that the writing was on the wall. He and his family were no longer welcome in Hamburg. And so he goes to the Lorber Society and kind of retires and says, you know, I'm leaving. You need to find yourself a new leader of this society. And then he and his family completely broke ties with the Lorber Society. They left Hamburg and fled south to Santa Cruz, which is a city on the Canary Islands in Spain. And so they settle into this little apartment inside of this busy city. And very quickly, they fell back into their old routines of constantly worshiping Frank, the prophet of God despite the fact that they were no longer affiliated with the Lorber Society, and so their actions were now being driven by their own personal belief system. Ten months later, on December 22, 1970, a wealthy doctor named Walter Trankler was at his villa, which was located not far from where the Alexanders lived, when he heard a knock at his front door. When he opened the front door, he saw there were these two men who he didn't recognize, who were covered head to toe in what looked like mud, and at first he was totally taken aback by their appearance and almost wanted to just shut the door. But in order to be polite, he kept the door slightly open and said, you know, hey, how can I help you guys? And the two men would introduce themselves as Harold and Frank Alexander, and they were there to speak with one of their family members, Sabine. Sabine was one of Frank's two younger sisters, and she worked for the doctor as a housemaid. And so the doctor, he didn't know any of Sabine's family members, so he just kind of took their request at face value and said, hold on, let me go get her. And so he leaves the front door, he goes into the kitchen, and he finds Sabine, this 15-year-old girl, and he tells her that your father and your brother are waiting for you outside, they want to talk to you. And so Sabine, without saying a word, puts her knife and the food down. She walks out of the kitchen with the doctor. And as they're walking towards the front door, the doctor stops about 10 or 15 feet away from the front door to kind of allow Sabine to walk up and have a semi-private conversation with her relatives, although they're still inside of his house, so he didn't want to go too far. And so the doctor is standing maybe 15 feet away, wondering if he should just turn around or maybe just go into the other room to let them speak, when he overhears the father, Harold, say something truly horrific to his daughter. It was so shocking that the doctor stopped what he was doing, turned, and looked directly at Sabine to see how she was going to react to what she just heard. But to the doctor's absolute shock, Sabine didn't break down and start crying or start screaming out in pain or anguish. Instead, she reached out and grabbed her father's muddy hand and pressed it to her cheek and said, I'm sure you did what was necessary. And then the two embraced. The doctor stood there totally shocked, staring at these people, wondering what the heck they're doing. Why are they here? What are they talking about? Is this really happening? And then he just kind of blurts out, hey, I'll be right back. Stay right there. And then the doctor turned around and darted out of the front hall into another room where he barricaded himself inside. And then he called the police. When the police showed up just a few minutes later, they rolled into the front lot and they saw Harold, Frank, and Sabine were still just casually standing in the front doorway of the doctor's villa, seemingly not really trying to go anywhere or do anything. And so the police get out of their car, they walk up to the trio and they say, you know, what's going on? What are you doing here? And Harold very calmly and casually tells one of the officers the same horrible thing that the doctor overheard him saying to Sabine. Except this time, Harold specified to the officers where this horrible thing took place. He said it happened inside of their apartment. The police were shocked at Harold's candidness and the fact that his two kids were standing right next to him and they're hearing what their father is saying. They too are just totally detached and very calm as if nothing their father is saying is having any effect on them. It's just totally business as usual. And so the police asked Harold to repeat the story a few times to make sure they were hearing him correctly. And then they just arrested Harold and his two kids. After the three Alexanders were brought to the police station, three other police officers were sent over to the Alexanders' apartment in Santa Cruz to see if what Harold had said was actually true. And when these officers opened the front door to that apartment, 
they immediately could tell it was all true. The following is the story of what happened inside of that apartment based on the testimony given by Frank and Harold. On December 21st, 1970, so that's one day before Frank and Harold arrived on the doorstep of the doctor's villa, the father and son were home in their apartment with the mother, Dragma, as well as two of the three sisters. It was 18-year-old Marina and 15-year-old Petra. The other sister, Sabine, she was over at the doctor's villa. She was staying with him for a couple of days while she worked there. At some point that afternoon, Dragma and Harold left the living room and went into one of the bedrooms to lie down and take a nap. And after they lie down, Frank, for some reason, gets up from the living room and walks into the bedroom and sits down on the edge of the bed and just stares down at his mother. And when his mother rolls over and looks up at her son, Frank would later tell police that the look she gave him was suggestive and it was offensive to Frank and he believed she was not permitted to look at him that way. And so in this moment that she's looking at him, he said he instinctively knew that the killing hour was upon them. The killing hour was not a Lorber Society concept. It was something that Frank and most likely Harold had come up with and the rest of the family, the mother and the three sisters, had totally accepted. According to Frank and Harold, women were unpure and the only way to purify them, i.e. send them to heaven and not hell, was to murder them. And so it was just fundamentally understood in the Alexander household that at some point Frank was going to declare that the killing hour was upon them. And when that happened, all the women in the household were told to stop what they were doing and wait for Frank to sacrifice them. Meaning, wait for Frank to ritualistically kill them. So after Frank has seen this offensive look on his mother's face, he now feels like the killing hour is upon them, and so he literally announces it to his mother and to his father, who's right next to her, and then Frank grabs a nearby wooden coat hanger and strikes his mother on the top of her head. Now, his mother, she's heard that the killing hour is upon them, and he's starting to beat her, and so what does she do? She follows the rules. She flips herself over onto her stomach, puts her hands down by her side, and lays flat and still so Frank can more easily kill her. And so Frank begins wailing on the back of his mother's head with this wooden coat hanger, while his father, Harold, excitedly leaps out of the bed, doesn't try to stop what's going on. He runs into the living room and he begins very enthusiastically playing the organ. An organ is like a piano that's played a lot of times inside of Christian churches. And so with all this commotion going on in the house, the other two sisters that were there, Marina and Petra, they come out of their bedrooms into the living room, they see their father playing the organ, and they look into the bedroom where they hear all this noise and it's Frank murdering their mother. And they're looking at this happening, they're not doing anything, they're just staring at it. And then their father says to them, the killing hour is upon us, you need to get ready. And so the girls, when they hear this, they know the rules. And so they stop watching this attack and they make their way over to the center of the living room and they sit down cross-legged and they begin to patiently wait their turn. After a while, Frank stopped beating his mother who was now unconscious or perhaps even dead and he walked out of the bedroom into the living room where he saw his father on the organ and he saw his two sisters sitting on the ground. And so without any hesitation, he walks over to Marina, the older one, the 18 year old, and he begins hitting her on the top of the head until she slouches over onto the ground motionless. And then he turns to the younger one, Petra, the 15 year old, and he does the same thing to her until she's laying on the ground motionless. After this, Frank stands up and he leaves the living room and goes into the kitchen where he retrieves a small knife, pruning shears, and a hammer. At this point, it's likely that one or two of the Alexander women were still alive. And so Frank, he comes back into the living room with these tools in hand and with the organs blaring in the background, he begins to systematically hack off the breasts and genitals of his two sisters and his mother. And apparently this was a very slow and physically difficult task. And so he and his father Harold began switching off. One person would be on the organs while the other was mutilating and they would switch back and forth until all of the offending parts on these three women had been removed and nailed to the wall. The last mutilation this father and son committed was to cut the heart out of the mother, Dragma, and they wrapped it up in a cord and then nailed this cord to the wall as well. Then, with the three Alexander women either dead or close to death, the father and son began running around the apartment yelling and singing and rejoicing. They were extremely proud of what they had just done. 
Later that night, they left the apartment and slept in another property that they owned. And then the following day, December 22nd, they went to the doctor's villa to tell Sabine the good news. And so they knock on the door, the doctor answers, he goes back and gets Sabine. Sabine walks up and Harold, her father, says to her, Sabine, we wanted to tell you right away that Frank and I have just finished killing your mother and your sisters. To which Sabine walks up to him, takes her father's hand, presses it to her cheek and says, I'm sure you did what was necessary. This, of course, is what the doctor saw and overheard that was so horrible and prompted him to call the police. It was also the moment when he realized that was not mud all over these two men. That was their family member's blood. Psychiatrists would ultimately determine that Frank and Harold were not mentally fit to stand trial, and so they were both committed to an asylum for the criminally insane. Both men never showed any remorse or regret about what they had done. In fact, they continued to justify their actions by saying, because of them, these three women got to go to heaven. As for the one surviving daughter, Sabine, she pleaded with authorities to let her go live with her brother and her father in this asylum, but they rejected this request and sent her to live in a convent, which is a building that nuns live in, and no one really knows what happened to her after that. Shockingly, in 1990, so roughly 20 years after Frank and Harold were put into this asylum, they managed to escape, and they were never caught. To this day, their whereabouts remain unknown. The next and final story of today's episode is called Someone in This Family Has a Secret. Strongsville, Ohio used to be just another typical quiet American suburb. Nice homes, nice families, nice restaurants, and a mall. But in late 2017, a discovery was made in Strongsville that put this town on the map in the worst way possible. To understand this discovery, we need to go back to early 2016 when this town's nightmare began. In early 2016, two longtime Strongsville residents, Bruce and Melinda Pleskovic, received some very exciting news. Their 20-year-old daughter named Anna and her 20-year-old fiancé named Jeff had just told them they were expecting a baby, a baby girl. And so Bruce and Melinda were totally excited about the prospect of finally becoming grandparents. But at the same time, they knew Anna and Jeff did not have very much money. Anna still lived at home with Bruce and Melinda. She did have a job, but she made very little money. She was a waitress at a local Applebee's restaurant. And as for Jeff, he had a better job working as a service technician for a heating and air company, but he didn't have enough money to support him and Anna. In fact, he didn't even have enough money to move out of his parents' home. He was still living with them on the other side of Strongsville. And so this couple, they're really excited about their baby, but Bruce and Melinda are thinking, you know, we really got to find a way to support them because they are just not prepared for this first child. And so Bruce and Melinda, they talked it over and they decided the best way to support this young couple was to tell their daughter if she wanted to, she could invite Jeff to come stay at their house. That way, the two of them could be together, and once they had their daughter, Bruce and Melinda could be the great-grandparents and help take care of the baby. And in general, this would allow the couple to just continue to save money and move out when they were ready. And so when they told Anna they were willing to do this, Anna was so happy, she was so grateful, she called Jeff, and Jeff was equally happy and grateful and said, yes, I would love to move in with you guys. So it took several months, but finally in June of 2016, which was the same month that Jeff and Anna welcomed their daughter to the world, Jeff would leave his parents' home and move into Bruce and Melinda's home. And almost immediately after he moved in, he and the rest of Anna's family began experiencing some very strange and disturbing things around their property. Just a few days after Jeff had moved in, he and Anna were home alone. They were on the main floor of the house and they were having dinner at the kitchen table. And at some point, Jeff just happened to glance out one of the back windows that looked out into their backyard. And now this property had this huge sprawling backyard. Basically, they had all these houses kind of in a row and they all had almost like a communal backyard, this big open space. 
And so Jeff is looking out into this huge backyard and he sees off in the distance something strange. He doesn't really know what he's looking at because it's nighttime, it's dark, but he stands up and he walks over to the window. And as he's looking out, he sees way off on the backside of their property are these four strangers just standing there appearing to be smoking something. And they're just kind of looking up at the Pleskovic house. And so Jeff is looking out the window at these four, not really sure what to make of them. And he calls Anna over. And so Anna walks over and the two of them are looking out not really sure what to do. I mean, on the one hand, these four people who they clearly didn't know or they believed they didn't know were definitely trespassing. But at the same time, they weren't really doing anything. They were just kind of standing there smoking. But as they're watching these four people, one of them begins walking up the property towards their home and then stops alongside the Pleskovic trampoline, which was in their backyard. And this person begins fiddling with the trampoline. And so at this, Anna's like, you know what? I don't know what they're doing. I feel totally uncomfortable. And so Anna would actually call the police. And so the police, they come out. But by the time the squad car arrived in front of the Pleskovic house, the four people in back must have seen the car and they took off running. And so when the police officer went in the back yard and looked around. There was no one there. And there was also no sign they were there. There was no dropped cigarette butts or anything. They just kind of vanished. And so the police officer told Jeff and Anna, if they come back, you know, let us know. And so the officer left. And then a little while later, when Bruce and Melinda came home, Jeff and Anna would tell them about what happened. And they would agree that that was totally strange, that in all the decades they had lived in Strongsville, they had never had anybody stroll onto their property and just loiter in the middle of the night. And so for the next couple of days, the family was definitely on edge. But after a little while, this whole incident was largely forgotten about. Fast forward about five months to November 2016, and Anna was home alone with her young daughter, and she's playing with her daughter on the first floor of the house towards the front of the house. And as she's playing with her daughter, she suddenly hears what sounds like someone trying to open the back sliding glass door on the back of the house. And so instinctively, Anna thinks, okay, you know, Jeff must be out there, or my parents must be out there, and they don't have a key or something. And so she scoops up her daughter, and she begins walking towards the back of the house to open the store for them. And when she walks into one of the back rooms, before she reaches the back door, she happens to look out one of the windows that looked out into the backyard. And standing right up against the glass is this unknown male figure with his face pressed up against the glass. And so Anna just freezes and stares at this guy. And then this guy, he notices Anna and he ducks down out of view. And now Anna's thinking to herself, this is the guy. He must have been trying to break in my back door. I'm home alone. I don't know what's going on here. I don't know if he's going to try to break in again. And so she just turns and runs back towards the front of the house. She runs upstairs. She goes in a bedroom. She locks the door and she calls the police. But by the time the police come out there and they look around, they can't find this unknown figure that was at the back of the house. And there's no sign of an attempted forced entry. And so unfortunately, they told her, look, you know, I'm sure this was very traumatic for you, but there's really nothing we can do here. There's no evidence to suggest who did this. And so please just, you know, keep your house locked. And if you see anybody suspicious on your property, call us back. And so naturally, after the police left and Anna had a chance to contact Jeff and her parents, they were horrified and they rushed home to comfort her. And then after the initial shock of this incident had worn off, the family began to speculate, you know, do you think this might be connected to those four strangers we saw on our property a few months ago? It just seems odd that those two things would happen so close together. And then the family began to think, okay, well then who is this person? Who are these people? What do they want? Why are they targeting us? What's going on? Because as it was, the Pleskovic family, they didn't have any enemies, at least none that they knew of. If anything, the people of Strongsville adored this family, especially Melinda, the mother. For the past 20 plus years, she had been a middle school teacher in town and her students adored her. She was also a big time soccer coach in the community because she had played in college and she was still very passionate about it. So she was this amazing coach. And in the eyes of many parents in the Strongsville community, Melinda was a bit of an inspiration because she was not only the mother to Anna, she was also the mother of an 18 year old boy named Kyle who had Down syndrome and was nonverbal. And Melinda just had this unbelievable believable way with him where she was so good to him. She incorporated him in everything. She got him so involved. She gave him the best life he could possibly have. And so anytime you saw Kyle with his mother, Kyle would be all smiles. Even though Kyle couldn't speak, it was so obvious his mother made him incredibly happy. 
But regardless of the reason for these strangers to be lurking around their property, the Pleskovic family was now totally on edge and found themselves constantly looking out the windows, especially at night, in fear these strangers were going to come back and might try to break in again. And unfortunately, these strangers would come back. In January of 2017, so two months after Anna saw that unknown figure at the window and heard the back door sliding around, Bruce's car was broken into. It was sitting in the driveway of their property. Someone got inside of it and stole his laptop. And so Bruce, he calls the police and he says, you know, I've got to believe this has to do with the people that are harassing my family. And the police believed him and they began looking around and asking around, but they could never track down the laptop or the thief. And so once again, the family was kind of left on their own. And the police said, look, you know, if you see anything else, let us know. But there's not much we can do here. A few months later, in July of that year, Anna, Jeff, and their daughter were all home together one night when Anna happened to look out one of the back windows on their first floor and out on the very back of the property were three strangers just standing in that same spot where they saw those four strangers smoking the year before. And these three strangers are just standing there looking up at the house. And so horrified, Anna calls out to Jeff and says, look, there are three people in the back of our property. And so Anna, she pulls out her phone and she's calling the police. And as she's calling the police, Jeff, who's totally upset that there are these people harassing him and his family and making them feel unsafe, he just grabs a flashlight and storms out the back door to go confront these people. But as soon as Jeff went out the back door, before he could even shine the light on them, the three people had turned and ran and vanished. And so finally, when the police did show up, they were aware of all the calls they had gotten from this family. And so they went out there and they did a serious search for these three strangers. But like always, nothing was found. And so the family once again was told, if you see anything else, let us know. The following month, which was August, Anna was home with her daughter along with her mother who was upstairs. And as Anna is in the front of the house in the playroom with her daughter, she hears the sound of somebody trying to open that back sliding door. And now immediately her radar is up because she knows what happened the last time she heard the sound. There was that person in the window. But she's thinking, okay, I can't just immediately call the police. I need to at least look and see if there's someone that I know at the back door. And so she scoops her daughter up, she stands up, and she walks around to the edge of the room she's in, and she kind of peeks her head down this hallway that will give her a clear view of this backsliding glass door. And once she finally has a full view of whoever is there, she screams because there are two large adults, as she would say, standing at the back door trying to force open this door. And so when she screams, these two strangers, they hear it, they turn around and they run. And Melinda, she was upstairs. She hears her daughter screaming. She comes flying downstairs. She's trying to figure out what's going on. Anna is hysterical. The baby's crying. And so Melinda actually calls the police about what her daughter has just seen. The police come out. They search the property. They can't find anyone. And so again, the police leave and they tell the family, look, you know, I'm sorry this is happening to you, but we can't do anything. So please just let us know if anything else happens and we'll be out here as soon as we can. You know, we're bound to catch these people, but you know, right now we just don't have much to operate on. The following month, which was September, one of Melinda's car keys would go missing. And whoever had these keys, whoever had stolen these keys, would use it to randomly start Melinda's car in the middle of the night. And they also used it to set off her car alarm at odd hours of the night. And then also during this time frame that her keys were missing, they also discovered that there were nails jammed into the tires of Bruce's car. And so, of course, you know, the family calls the police and tells them about what's going on, but the police can't do anything. And so very frustrated, Melinda actually takes to Facebook and posts that someone's stolen her keys and please just give them back. And just overall, she's pleading with whoever is harassing her family to just leave them alone. But unfortunately, this post would not do anything. The harassment would continue. A month later, on October 19th, Jeff was home alone when he heard the sound of the back sliding glass door rattling. And now he knows that every time this has been heard by Anna, that there's always some stranger at the back door. And so Jeff grabs the family dog and he very carefully turns and looks down that hallway towards the back door to see who this is. And right as he pokes his head out, he sees there's this large adult figure with a hood up trying to open this back door. And so the dog sees this person and starts barking and running towards the door. 
Jeff runs after the dog, and this big person outside is trying to break in. He sees the dog, he sees Jeff running, and he turns and he runs away. And so Jeff and the dog, they stay inside the house and they watch this guy just take off across the property and disappear into the trees. And Jeff would call the police, but like always, the police came out and there just was nothing they could do. Four days later, on October 23rd, Jeff, along with his young daughter and Bruce, they went to the local Applebee's where Anna worked to have dinner there and have Anna wait on them. And then after they were done eating, they said their goodbyes to Anna, they left the restaurant, they hopped in their cars, and they drove back to their house. When they got there, Bruce was the first up the steps and he got to the front door and it was locked. And so he knocked and Kyle, his son, he came and unlocked the door. Bruce went inside, followed closely behind by Jeff, who was holding his daughter. They get inside, and Bruce walks through the house to the back of the house where the kitchen is. He flips on the lights, and there's something on the kitchen floor. And when Jeff sees it, he immediately turns around and runs out of the house carrying his daughter. He grabs Kyle along the way and just takes them straight out of the house. And then once Jeff was outside, he called 911. And when you listen to his 911 call, it sounds like Jeff is unable to process what he has just seen. 911, what's the address of your emergency? Uh, somebody, somebody's been attacked in my house. Somebody's been what? Attacked. They attacked who? Who was attacked? Uh, uh, Mel Pleskovic. Mel Pleskovic was attacked. He was attacked by whom? Do you know? She, she was, no, we, we just came home. She's on the kitchen floor. Jeff and Bruce had just discovered Melinda lying on the kitchen floor. She'd been stabbed over 35 times and shot three times. She would be rushed to the hospital, but she would die that night. Although the family was in shock and couldn't even begin to process what had just happened, they were all acutely aware that whoever had done this to Melinda had to be connected to all of these strange and suspicious people that had been lurking around their property for the better part of two years. In fact, literally after Jeff had called 911, Bruce was inside in the kitchen kneeling next to his dying wife and he called 911 and he would tell the dispatcher that the Strongsville Police Department really dropped the ball. 911, what city is the emergency in? Please come to one for Blazing Star. I think my wife's dead. Someone tell me. We tell had me people to... breaking into our fucking house. Sir. And now someone fucking killed her. Sir, tell me the city you need to talk to. Strongville, Ohio. Okay, you need to be transferred. Don't hang up. 911, what's the city of your emergency? Strongville, Ohio. We have people on the way already. What's the address? For Blazing Star. I think someone killed my wife. You think someone killed your wife? Yeah, there it looks like okay, she has stab on her back. We've had okay. people trying to break into sir, our house sir, all year. Sir, stealing I to, sir, I need to ask you questions, okay? Are you there right now? I just got in the door with my new son-in-law. My son Kyle was here Okay, what, her. sir, what I want you to do is walk out. The Strongsville Police Department would come out in force for this case, and they would solve it in just four days. And when they went public with who killed Melinda, no one could believe it. Back on October 23rd, so this was the night Melinda was discovered, Jeff, along with his young daughter and Melinda and her son Kyle, they were all together in the house. And at some point, Jeff had put his daughter down in her playpen and then went into the kitchen where Melinda was. And he walked up to her, pulled out a knife and stabbed her over 35 times. And then when Melinda fell to the ground, Jeff drew a gun and shot her three additional times to make sure she was dead. Now, while he was doing this, his daughter is literally just a few feet away, and Kyle, presumably, is also right nearby. But he has no way of understanding what's happening to his mother. And so with these two totally innocent lives just right nearby, Jeff would clean off his weapons and he'd take off his bloody clothes and he would hide them inside of his car. And then he would just scoop up his daughter and he would leave the house, leaving Kyle alone in the house with his dying mother in the kitchen, just leaves him there, shuts the door, locks it. And then Jeff and his daughter would drive to Applebee's to have dinner with Melinda's husband and her daughter. And then after several hours, when they got back to the property, Jeff knew what was waiting for them inside, and he still allowed Bruce to go inside first and discover his dying wife on the kitchen floor. Very little is known about why Jeff did this, because Jeff has actually never come out and given his motive for the crime. 
The running theory is that Jeff actually was not going to be able to pay for the wedding, which was coming up in a couple of days. And the wedding venue had actually contacted Melinda and said, hey, you know, we're canceling the wedding because your future son-in-law can't pay for it. And so Melinda apparently confronted Jeff about his financial troubles. And the theory is he snapped and killed her. However, that can't possibly be the entire story for why he did this. Because it would turn out Jeff was found to be responsible for literally every single suspicious event that had taken place around the Pleskovic property leading up to the attack. Meaning every time they had seen strangers lurking around their property or people trying to break into their house, that had been because of Jeff. Either it was literally Jeff outside being one of these suspicious people, or he had asked friends or hired someone or groups of people to pretend to be suspicious people on the property, or Jeff had been the only person to see these suspicious people, and then miraculously when other people attempted to look outside, you know, they were gone. And so obviously Jeff was lying. And so I actually had the opportunity to speak with one of Jeff's childhood friends who was actually living roughly in the Strongsville area when this horrible murder took place. And what this person told me is that what is kind of generally accepted as why Jeff did this, according to the people in Strongsville, is that Jeff apparently loathed Melinda. Even though she had opened her house to him, he loathed her. And as soon as he moved in in 2016, he began plotting to kill her. And so all of these suspicious events were Jeff's attempt at building this really intricate alibi that they had these strangers out there that were targeting this family. And so that when she would ultimately be killed by him, it would look like these strangers had done it. And at first, it totally worked. Everybody believed, the police, the family, friends, that strangers had broken into the house and killed Melinda. In fact, there was so little suspicion on Jeff after her murder that Jeff actually served as a pallbearer in Melinda's funeral. But ultimately, the police would discover the knife and some bloody clothes in the back of Jeff's car. And so they would arrest him and they would present this mountain of evidence against him and Jeff would confess to killing Melinda. However, he wouldn't give any additional information about the crime. He would just basically say, yes, I did kill her. He would also never give an apology or explanation to the family. He would ultimately be sentenced to life in prison with the opportunity for parole after 33 years. During Jeff's trial, there was this totally heartbreaking moment when Bruce, Melinda's husband, spoke. And he would say their son, Kyle, does not understand that his mother is gone. And so now every time they go out to eat, which is something Kyle really likes to do and he used to love doing with his mother, he'll just sit and stare out the window, eagerly expecting his mother to show up any minute. But of course, she never does. 46-year-old Thomas Montgomery was a company man. For the last 12 years, he had punched a time clock at Dynabraid Incorporated, a factory in upstate New York that made high-quality power tools, from industrial-grade sanders to wheel grinders. So, when Thomas woke up on a Monday morning early in May of 2005, his routine that day was pretty much the same as it had been for the more than 500 Mondays that had come before it. Hearing the alarm go off at around 5.30 a.m., Thomas automatically reached out an arm and shut it off before the sound could wake up Cindy, his wife of 16 years, who was sleeping in the bed next to him. Then Thomas got up, grabbed his work clothes, and headed for the bathroom. Fifteen minutes later, he was walking down the upstairs hallway of his family's modest two-story house, past the bedrooms of his two daughters, one 12 years old and the other 14. After getting downstairs, he walked into the kitchen where he grabbed a cup of coffee and a quick bite to eat. As he sat at the kitchen table having his breakfast, he saw the family dog, Shadow, waiting at the back door, her tail slapping side to side. After he was done with his food and drink, Thomas pulled on a light jacket and a ball cap before opening the door and following Shadow outside into the chilly morning air. Fifteen minutes later, the dog was fed and back on her dog bed, the coffee cup and dirty breakfast plate were in the sink, and Thomas was climbing into his car and getting ready to back out of the driveway. But first, Thomas had to reach over his belly to pull on his seatbelt. And as he did this, he was reminded that he was a good 25 years and 50 pounds away from his physical prime, back when he was a U.S. Marine. Thomas had never seen combat while he was in the military, but his six years in the Marine Corps still gave Thomas a deep sense of pride. 
especially considering the fact that at the time, the United States Marine Corps was undertaking some of the most dangerous missions in the US war against terror in Iraq. Pulling his mind back to the present, Thomas finally buckled his seatbelt, then started the car engine and backed out of the driveway onto the quiet residential street on the outskirts of Buffalo, the second largest city in New York State. After tuning the car radio to his favorite sports station, Thomas then headed north to pick up New York State Highway 5, which would take him to Clarence, New York, where Dynabraid was located. Settling back into the driver's seat, Thomas made the uneventful 12-mile drive from Cheektowaga, the town where he lived, to his company's factory and their surrounding sea of parking lots. Thomas found a parking spot shortly before 7 a.m., and then he hopped out of his car and walked inside the building to join the line of other Dynabraid machinists, all getting ready to clock in, put on their clear plastic safety glasses, and get to work. Eight long hours later, Thomas had clocked out and was back in his car headed home. In about half an hour, he'd be walking the dog again, and when that was done, he'd be taking his two daughters off to swim practice at the local swim club, where he spent so much time that the club had asked him to be its vice president. But as Thomas made the 20-minute drive back home, his thoughts had skipped ahead from swim practice and then dinner to how he planned to spend that evening. For years, Thomas had lived for his Friday nights. That was when he and some buddies from work got together to play poker. However, recently, Thomas had discovered a new hobby, one that was more exciting than poker and one that he could enjoy every night of the week. Thomas had discovered an internet website called Pogo.com. Launched in 1998, Pogo was a platform that offered everything from Scrabble and Monopoly to card games like Blackjack. If you signed up for a membership like Thomas had, you could skip most of the ads. Players used tokens rather than real money, but you could exchange those tokens for rewards and prizes of real monetary value. Players created usernames and online profiles, and not only could they play games against each other and with each other, but they could also use the chat room feature on Pogo that allowed them to message other players in their game, as well as other Pogo users that were outside of their particular game. While some of the chat rooms were technically listed as being just for kids, and there were other digital rooms that were just for adults, in reality, Pogo generally relied on its members and players to self-enforce the age restrictions. Thomas was aware that the site was used primarily by young people. He and his wife Cindy were both active in their local church, and as a Sunday school teacher himself, Thomas overheard his students talking about Pogo all the time. Thomas also knew that one of his younger co-workers at Dynabraid, a 22-year-old named Brian Barrett, was also a big Pogo user. In fact, it was Brian's offhanded mention of the site that had led Thomas to check it out in the first place. But after Thomas signed up for the site, and he saw how much fun it was to get to play cards every night, he quickly stopped caring about the fact that he was likely one of the oldest people on there. In fact, he didn't even think about it. He hopped into different games and chat rooms without so much as looking at the age restrictions on them. So back on that Monday night in May of 2005, after Thomas had walked his dog and taken his kids to swim practice and had dinner after all that, he shooed his two daughters off of the family computer in the living room, and with his wife Cindy sitting nearby in her usual spot on the sofa watching TV, Thomas made himself comfortable and logged into Pogo. Just typing in his screen name, which was Marine Sniper, gave him a sense of satisfaction. Thomas had never actually been a sniper in the Marine Corps, but the name reminded him of his glory days in the service. Usually, on Pogo, Thomas would just go straight to the Texas Hold'em poker rooms, but tonight he decided to play a little blackjack. But Thomas had hardly started looking at his first hand when he heard a ping and saw he'd gotten a direct message from another player with the screen name Tall Hot Blonde. Her private message just said to him, You're in the wrong room. This room is for kids. Thomas had a moment of panic. He hadn't checked to see whether this chat room slash game room was for kids or adults, and suddenly he wondered what would happen to him if it was revealed that he was a 40-something-year-old man playing with kids. Would he be kicked off of Pogo? Thomas did not want that to happen. Thomas loved Pogo. Playing these online card games and chatting with random strangers in the chat rooms had become an escape from the daily drudgery of his job and his routine. 
It also took his mind off the fact that in the last year or so, he'd had more and more problems with impotence, and that had put a strain on his marriage. His wife, Cindy, wanted to talk to him about it and spend more time together. Thomas, on the other hand, wanted to just ignore it and be left alone. So it didn't take Thomas long to decide how he was going to respond to Tall Hot Blonde's message. A second later, Thomas, aka Marine Sniper, wrote back, Don't worry, I'm 18 years old. What about you? How old are you? While Tall Hot Blonde didn't tell Marine Sniper her real name, she did tell him that she was a 17-year-old high school senior who lived in Western Virginia. She liked sports, and she played on her school's softball and basketball teams, and she wasn't sure yet what she was going to do after high school. And what about him? She typed. Are you really a sniper? Sitting there in front of the computer screen, Thomas felt a sudden, intense rush of excitement. The question had given him a very unexpected thrill. He would never meet this girl, and here he had an opportunity to play the part of his much more interesting and exciting and exaggerated younger self. So, Marine Sniper told Tall Hot Blonde that, yes, well, soon he would be a sniper. He was a Marine recruit for now who went by the nickname Tommy. He was about to start boot camp soon, then he would go to sniper school, and then after that he would deploy to combat in Iraq. By the time Thomas had shut down his computer two hours later, Tall Hot Blonde had sent him pictures of herself wearing a small yellow bikini that showed off both her curves and her flat belly. She'd eventually told him that her real name was Jessica, but she went by Jessie, spelled J-E-S-S-I. She had one brother, and her family lived in a small house in the backwoods of West Virginia, where nothing exciting happened, at least not since she had come in first place, in a local beauty contest back in 2002. As Thomas turned out the downstairs lights and went upstairs to join Cindy in bed, he kept seeing those pictures of Jessie. With her wide smile, shoulder-length, straight blonde hair, and long, tanned legs, she more than lived up to the promise of her screen name. Thomas was already secretly hoping that the next time he logged on to Pogo, Tall Hot Blonde would be waiting for him. Thomas was still thinking about those pictures of Jessie when he woke up the next morning. And as soon as dinner that night was over, Thomas headed straight for the family computer. A minute later, he was on Pogo. Despite telling himself that this time he was just going to play a couple of hands of Texas Hold'em and then log off, Thomas kept clicking on his Pogo chat feature inbox, hoping he would see a private message come through from Tall Hot Blonde. And he didn't have to wait long. As soon as he saw the words, Tommy, is that you? pop up on his screen, Thomas felt that same thrill course through him that he'd felt the night before. And this time, there was no hesitation at all. Thomas began to add one lie after another to the fantastical story he told Tall Hot Blonde about Marine Sniper Tommy. After that, every night over the next few weeks, Marine Sniper and Tall Hot Blonde told each other intimate details about their lives. While the real Thomas Montgomery still got up early every morning to go to Dyna Braid and spend eight hours making components for power tools, in the evenings, he became the man he had dreamed of being. While Thomas was overweight and balding, Marine Sniper was six foot two inches tall and 190 pounds of pure muscle. While Thomas came home after work and walked the family dog and took his daughters to swim practice, Marine Sniper had the broad shoulders that Jessie had said she liked, along with a black belt in karate. While Thomas wore glasses and covered his bald spot with a ball cap, Marine Sniper looked a lot like a younger red-haired version of Hollywood heartthrob Harrison Ford. Soon, Jessie and Tommy had moved off of the Pogo chat feature and had started emailing each other and using Yahoo's instant messaging feature. Jessie's instant messenger name was Peaches0617, while Thomas went by Tommy Loves WV Fox. WV Fox stood for West Virginia Fox, clearly an allusion to Jessie. When Jessie finally asked Tommy to send her a picture, Thomas sent the headshot of himself that was taken almost 30 years earlier when he had graduated from boot camp. Even though it seemed fairly obvious that his picture was very out of date, Jessie didn't care. She was totally infatuated. And her fascination only grew as Thomas started concocting a tragic and hard luck backstory for Tommy that would make Jessie feel protective and sympathetic. According to Thomas, Tommy's father had also been a Marine, Tommy's mother had died of cancer, and that had been such a terrible blow that Tommy's life had gone completely off the rails. 
In fact, his decision to join the Marines and become a sniper was so he could finally just make a fresh start with his life after a high school cheerleader had threatened to ruin his life by accusing him of rape. When Thomas told Jesse that before meeting her online, his plan had been to commit suicide in Iraq, Jesse had begged Tommy to stay alive for her sake. Jesse worried endlessly about Tommy's safety, and she told him again and again that despite whatever mistakes he had made in the past, she was proud of him and would always stand by him. After reading that, Tommy told Jesse that the Marine motto, Semper Fidelis, which means always faithful, should be their motto too. Over the next six months, both Thomas and Jesse would become completely obsessed with their relationship, to the point where it was the only thing either of them ever thought about. Unlike 46-year-old Thomas, who struggled with impotence, 18-year-old Marine Sniper told Jesse that he had nine inches worth of endowment. Meanwhile, Jesse sent Tommy dozens of pictures of herself. However, none of them were her in the nude. She was always wearing clothes or a bathing suit. But to Thomas, the hours he spent wondering what was under those bathing suits made her photos even more enticing. There was one picture in particular, the camera peeking up under her miniskirt from behind, that really stirred Thomas's imagination. Within weeks of meeting each other, Thomas and Jesse were having virtual sex every night, and Jesse was telling Tommy that she loved him. Whenever Thomas's wife, Cindy, walked over to him and asked what he was doing on the computer, Thomas would immediately click out of the chat and insist that he was just playing online card games. And because Cindy was always asleep by the time Thomas eventually came to bed, she wasn't aware of the fact that Thomas was routinely staying up until 2 or 3 in the morning, telling Jesse all about what his, quote, snake would like to do to his, quote, foxy lady down there in West Virginia. And when Cindy did try to talk with Thomas about spending more time together, one of the remedies that their minister had suggested when they sought help for Thomas's impotence, Thomas told her that it was her nagging and her criticism of him that had led to his impotence problem in the first place. And so he didn't want to spend more time with her. He wanted to spend less time with her. Shortly after Marine Sniper and Tall Hot Blonde's online relationship had become very sexual, Thomas informed her that he had graduated from Marine boot camp and was now on active duty, and before long, he would be shipping out to Iraq. This is when Thomas introduced to Jesse his totally made-up father and former Marine, Tom Sr. His role would be crucial to keeping the Marine Sniper fantasy alive. With the creation of Tom Sr., Thomas would be able to keep his daily connection to Jesse, who would be able to chat with Tom Sr. whenever Tommy was busy being an active duty Marine. And Tom Sr. would be able to pass her messages along to his son when Tommy eventually deployed to Iraq. In addition to speaking with Jesse every day online, either as Marine Sniper or through Marine Sniper's dad, Tom Sr., Real-life Thomas also started calling 17-year-old Jesse every day of the week as he drove to and from his job at Dynabraid, claiming that those were the only times he was off-duty from being a Marine. But even this added layer of connection to Jesse wasn't enough for Thomas, and in time, Thomas started to act very jealous. Whenever he noticed a new friend added to Jesse's MySpace page, MySpace was a very early social media platform, or saw that she was chatting with other people online in the public pogo chat rooms, Thomas instantly suspected she had other boyfriends and therefore was cheating on him. And it was true that Tall Hot Blonde had become an accomplished cyber flirt and seemed to enjoy the power she had over Marine Sniper, who showed absolutely no interest in any other girls. Tall Hot Blonde and Marine Sniper had their first lover's quarrel when Thomas became convinced that Jessie was sending pictures of herself to other internet admirers. Jessie did not deny the accusation. However, she told Marine Sniper that she was devastated by what he was claiming. And so, to make Tommy feel better, she sent him a pair of her red G-string panties along with a silver Key to My Heart keychain. She sent the package to Thomas's real address. He had said that that was where his father lived and that he could forward any mail he got to Tommy wherever he was in the world. When Tommy received the panties, he forgave Jesse. However, his dad, Tom Sr., did not. 
Shortly after the panties arrived, Thomas, writing as Marine Sniper's father, Tom Sr., would send the 17-year-old girl a crude message calling her a bitch and accusing her of lying and trying to hurt his son. One evening, just before Christmas in December of 2005, so seven months after first meeting Jesse on Pogo.com, Thomas once again chased his daughters off of the family computer and sat down to log into his Yahoo Instant Message account. For weeks leading up to that night, Thomas had begun talking incessantly to his co-workers at Dynabraid about how he was going to leave his wife, Cindy, and go to West Virginia to be with this new woman who had come into his life. 22-year-old Brian Barrett, who was the co-worker who Thomas had overheard talking about having a pogo account, wasn't really surprised to hear what Thomas was talking about. Brian had heard lots of the old-timers at Dynabraid going on and on about their big plans for escaping their lives. But Brian and the rest of Thomas's co-workers had no idea that Thomas's mystery woman was actually just a 17-year-old girl. As Thomas's instant messenger account loaded up on the computer, he glanced over at Cindy, who was in her usual place on the sofa watching TV. He barely noticed all of the Christmas decorations that his wife and his daughters had put up all over the living room that day. Because the only thing on Thomas's mind at that moment was what he was about to ask Jesse. He turned back to the family computer, and after exchanging a few casual messages with Jesse, Thomas got straight to the point. He told her that Tommy didn't know if he was going to make it out of Iraq alive. But before he shipped out, he wanted to marry Jesse. And would she have him? Jesse's answer came right away. Oh my god, yes, yes, she would marry her sweet, sexy Marine. The next night, when Thomas logged into his instant messenger account again, he saw excited messages from Jesse telling Marine Sniper that she was already planning their first night in bed together. It would be her first time, she told him, but she was more excited than nervous. She also told Thomas that from now on, even before they officially got married, she'd be referring to herself as Jessica Blair Montgomery. Days later, another package of Jesse's panties arrived at the Montgomery house, and along with them was a set of engraved dog tags that read Tom and Jesse always and forever. Rationally speaking, Thomas knew that there was no way he could ever marry 17-year-old Jesse. But at the same time, he just could not accept that at some point he would have to give up not just Jesse, but Tommy, the Marine sniper. And so, at some point, shortly after asking her to marry him, Thomas made up his mind. He decided he would find a way to marry Jesse and have a real life with her outside of the internet. And to do that, he needed to become 18-year-old Marine Sniper Tommy. And so, on January 2nd, 2006, while he was on a break at Dynabraid, he pulled out a piece of stationery with the company logo at the top and wrote a letter that was part New Year's resolution and part manifesto describing this vision he had for the future. It read, On January 2, 2006, Tom Montgomery, 46 years old, ceases to exist and is replaced by an 18-year-old battle-scarred Marine. He is moving to West Virginia to be with the love of his life. Thomas also wrote in this strange letter that Marine Sniper had more than $2 million and would use that money to take care of Cindy and his two daughters as well as help him build his new life with Jesse. At the end of this note, Thomas wrote, quote, I wish I would know the exact time I would change to new Tom so I can prepare for it. After he signed his name to this letter, Thomas folded the piece of paper up and locked it in the toolbox he kept at work. In mid-March 2006, so two months after Thomas penned this New Year's resolution slash manifesto, one of his daughters, who was home from school and waiting for her mom and her dad to get home, was researching an assignment on the family computer when she heard a ping. Thomas had accidentally forgot to log out of his instant message account before he left for work that morning. Okay, back to the story. And so the message that his daughter received came from Jesse, tall, hot, blonde, and it was very sexually explicit and was clearly intended for Thomas. Thomas's daughter stared at the message, shocked, 
Could it really be for her father? Feeling sick, she pushed herself away from the computer and she called her mom, telling her there was something she needed to come home and look at. Hearing the strain in her daughter's voice, Cindy left work and 15 minutes later, she was sitting at the family computer, scrolling through the hundreds of emails that her husband had written to a girl who went by the names Tall Hot Blonde and Peaches 0617. Horrified, Cindy finally turned away from the computer and went upstairs and started searching through her husband's drawers and closet, where she would find a treasure trove of handwritten letters and pictures, lingerie, and a set of dog tags engraved with Tom and Jesse always and forever. When Thomas finally pulled into the driveway that night, Cindy was waiting for him inside. As the mother of two teenage daughters, she could not believe that her husband had tricked and seduced a teenage girl who had never even been outside of the state of West Virginia into falling in love with an 18-year-old Marine who did not even exist. When Thomas stepped through the front door holding his car keys and lunchbox, he saw his wife standing in front of him. She looked sad and furious and she was holding a handful of frilly girls' underwear, including a bright red G-string. Thomas knew, like a punch right to his stomach, that his wife knew his secret. And when he tried to act surprised, like he had no idea what Cindy was holding out to him, even trying to step around her into the hallway, Cindy was not convinced even for a second. Instead, she walked over to the family computer and began reciting out loud some of the lewd things Thomas had sent Jesse. Cindy told Thomas that what he was doing and what he had done was not only totally inappropriate and totally disgusting, but it was likely illegal. Jesse was a minor. And if that wasn't enough, Cindy told Thomas that his own teenage daughter had been the one to discover this raunchy affair. Cindy told her husband that he only had two options, give up this totally inappropriate, bizarre fantasy, or they could get divorced. As he stood there in stunned and guilty silence, Cindy told him that for now, he just needed to go away. Go walk the dog, go cut the grass, anything. But right now, she couldn't even stand to be near him. Thomas said nothing and turned around and walked back outside. As soon as Cindy was alone, she sat down at the kitchen table and composed a careful letter to Jesse. And as she slipped it inside of an envelope, she also enclosed a recent picture of the Montgomery family. Let me introduce you to these people, Cindy had written. The man in the center is Tom, my husband since 1989. He is 46 years old, and here are our two daughters, 12 and 14 years old. Cindy told Jesse that there is no Tommy, there is no Marine sniper. Cindy closed the note with a piece of advice for Jesse. Do not trust the words you read on a computer. When Jesse got Cindy's letter, she was completely crushed. Before breaking off all contact with the 46-year-old man she now knew had been posing as Marine Sniper, she sent Thomas a series of furious and hurt messages asking him how he could have done this to her and telling him he should have to go to jail for what he had done. For his part, Thomas, who still lived in the same house with his wife and daughters but slept in the basement, told Jesse he was sorry and that he never meant to hurt her. And Thomas told his wife, Cindy, that although he was totally ashamed of what he had done to her and to the family, he was relieved that she had found out because the guilt and the stress of this double life had become an unbearable burden. And for the next six weeks, even though Thomas still occasionally logged on to pogo.com to play cards, he did not hear another word from Tall Hot Blonde. But it would turn out, despite no longer communicating with Thomas, Jesse was nowhere near forgetting or forgiving what Thomas had done to her. She also began to wonder if maybe the letter she had received from Cindy was a trick. Maybe, thought Jesse, Cindy was really another girl who was also in love with Marine Sniper, and maybe Cindy had made up that whole story about Tommy being 46 years old and married with kids so that Cindy could have Tommy all to herself. Within two weeks of getting Cindy's letter and the picture of the Montgomery family, Jessie was back on Pogo, but this time she was looking for friends of Marine Sniper who could tell her the truth about him. On April 17th, Jessie got her answer. She had found another person online that Tommy had once mentioned to her. It was a user who went by the name Beefcake1572. 
He was a 22-year-old student at Buffalo State College who also worked part-time at a company called Dynabraid in upstate New York. This man's name was Brian Barrett. Again, the same Brian Barrett who Thomas had overheard talking about Pogo that had inspired Thomas to log into Pogo in the first place. And it didn't take much time in a private chat room for Tall Hot Blonde and Beefcake to put together all the pieces of the puzzle. It also didn't take long for Beefcake to fall completely in love with Tall Hot Blonde, who wasted no time sending him the same titillating pictures she had sent to Thomas. Jessie was Brian's ideal girl, blonde, beautiful, and athletic. When Beefcake confirmed that his co-worker, Marine Sniper, really was 46-year-old Thomas Montgomery, and that he really did have two teenage daughters and a wife named Cindy, Jessie was crushed all over again. She was also very, very angry. As she and Beefcake got together in the Princess Priceless room on Pogo and played Lotso, which is a cross between bingo and the lottery, Jessie told her new admirer how hurt and heartbroken she was over Thomas's betrayal. It didn't take long for Beefcake to feel just as outraged as Jesse over the predatory and creepy behavior of this older man he once thought of as a good friend and co-worker. So by the time Jesse got around to asking Beefcake if he would help her teach Thomas Montgomery a lesson, Brian, dazzled by Jesse's beauty and attention, was all in. He asked her, what do you need me to do? A couple weeks later, at the end of April, 46-year-old Thomas Montgomery logged on to Pogo. However, as soon as he was logged in, he got a message saying that his account had been suspended due to complaints of inappropriate activity. Stunned, Thomas logged off and started going on some of the other gaming sites he often visited outside of Pogo, and what he saw on them horrified him. On each of these other sites were forums where members of the site could post questions or offer insights or whatever they wanted to talk about, and then other people on the site could click on those individual posts and they could comment and interact with them. And when Thomas logged into each of these other gaming sites, the forum page where all these different topics are listed was the first thing he saw. And immediately, he saw his real name in several of these posts. And when he clicked on them, he saw the posts were all about how he was this 46-year-old predator and pedophile who posed as this marine sniper. When Thomas checked to see who had written these posts, his heart sunk. They were all from either Tall Hot Blonde or Beefcake1572, who he instantly recognized as his co-worker, Brian. Meanwhile, Jesse and Brian became closer and closer. When Jesse suggested to Brian that he tell his co-workers at Dynabraid what Thomas had done, Brian didn't waste any time. He asked Thomas's co-workers if they remembered all that talk from Thomas about him leaving his wife Cindy and moving to West Virginia to be with this new mystery woman he had met. Then Brian put out the word that the mystery woman was really a 17-year-old girl that Thomas had met online by posing as an 18-year-old marine sniper. It didn't take long for Thomas to start seeing the dirty looks and hearing the nasty comments all around work. He was now sure that half the people at his office thought he was a loser and a predator, and parents no longer wanted him to be around their kids. Also, Brian outright told Thomas that he and Jesse were now an item, and that every time they interacted, things got hot and heavy. At home, banished to the basement and now using his own computer, Thomas sent Jesse an instant message that hinted at suicide. It said, you can say goodbye forever to me and Tommy. At first, Jesse was glad to see the damage her revenge campaign was doing to Thomas. And it was clear that Brian was also getting a thrill out of it as well. But eventually, Jesse started to feel bad about what was happening. And in a series of text messages that started a few weeks after she and Brian had begun publicly shaming Thomas, Jessie was back in touch with Thomas, telling him how much she missed her Tommy, and that Thomas was all she had left of her, quote, sweet, sexy Marine. Maybe, she told Thomas, they could just be friends, and together they could keep the memory of Marine Sniper Tommy and the passion they had shared alive. But despite Thomas agreeing to this just-be-friends arrangement, his relationship with Jesse pretty much immediately became very sexual and intimate again. Except now, it was not just Thomas and Jesse, it was Thomas, Jesse, and Brian. 
Despite Jessie's promise to Thomas that she would end her relationship with Brian, she didn't. And instead, she began going back and forth between the two men. And so in time, the hours that she and Thomas would spend messaging each other late into the night and early morning veered crazily between declarations of love and jealous outbursts from Thomas who kept seeing Brian's username pop up alongside Tall Hot Blonde on Pogo, other gaming sites, and on Jesse's MySpace page. Meanwhile, the tension between Thomas and Brian when they were at Dynabraid together was palpable. Thomas was furious with Brian, not only for interfering with his relationship with Jesse, but for also very publicly humiliating him. And Brian, who had developed real feelings for Jesse, had become furious with Thomas and felt like he really was a predator and a pedophile and should just go away. Thomas and Brian would openly argue and fight with each other at work. And then when they went home, they would get online and spend hours accusing each other of telling lies about their relationship with Jesse. But by mid-May, Brian was just tired of the drama. And so he told Thomas that he was just going to go to West Virginia and he was going to see Jesse in person and likely become intimate with her in person. And then she would be all his. Even though Jesse told Brian, no, do not make a trip to West Virginia, the damage to Thomas was done. From that moment forward, Thomas became obsessed with the idea that Jesse and Brian were going to take their relationship out of the cyber world, where Thomas felt like he had a chance with Jesse, into the real world, where 46-year-old Thomas stood no chance. By early September 2006, this obsession had made it impossible for Thomas to be even remotely civil with Jesse. His messages to her had become so crude and so violent that Jesse had just begun to ignore them. And when she did this, it only made Thomas more angry and more obsessed. At 10.16 p.m. on the night of September 15, 2006, Brian clocked out of his shift at Dynabraid. It was 63 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy outside. The quiet and the light northeast breeze were a welcome relief after the noise and bright lights inside the machine shop. As Brian walked across the nearly vacant parking lot, he kept his head down and fished his car keys out of his pocket. When he got to his white pickup truck, he polished a small smudge off the driver's side door before opening it up and hopping inside. Before Brian put his keys into the ignition, he paused and noticed that the back left side of his truck seemed to be sagging slightly. But before he could figure out why it was doing that, he noticed off to his left in his peripheral vision, a shadowy figure was moving across the lot toward him. Two days later, early on Monday morning, September 18th, Clarence, New York police got a 911 call from the security guard at the Dynabraid equipment factory. He just found the body of a young man who'd been shot dead at close range inside of his white truck that was parked in the Dynabraid parking lot. By the time the police arrived, so too had the first shift of Dynabraid workers. As the police set up a perimeter around the crime scene, co-workers stood by in total disbelief. Based on interviews with Brian's family, who had not seen him all weekend, and with his co-workers, who identified his truck and his body, along with records that showed when Brian had last left the Dynabraid factory, it only took police a few hours to come up with a preliminary theory about what had happened. Whoever killed Brian must have taken the young man by surprise. Brian sat slumped in the driver's seat of the truck, leaning slightly towards his right, away from the closed window with the three bullet holes punched through it. There were bullet wounds in his upper left arm and jaw and a gaping hole in the left side of his neck. Police noticed that Brian's back left tire on his truck was flat, and when they checked, they saw someone had punctured it with a knife. Also, a 30 caliber carbine rifle shell casing, as well as a peach pit, were discovered at the scene of the crime. Brian's family was devastated. They had absolutely no idea who might have wanted to harm their eldest child. When police interviewed Brian's parents, neither of them were aware of any problems or arguments that Brian was having at home, at school, or at work. But once police began interviewing Brian's co-workers at Dynabraid that Monday morning, they heard a very different story. It seemed to be common knowledge that Brian had had a serious falling out with a co-worker who had been acting more and more erratically in recent weeks. 
that co-worker's name was Thomas Montgomery, and it seemed like the two men had both been involved in an online relationship with the same woman, except she wasn't really a woman, she was actually a 17-year-old girl. Unable to locate Thomas, police were concerned, if he really was the killer, that Jessie, the 17-year-old girl, could be in danger. So police in New York went through Brian's cell phone and found contact information for Jesse and then contacted authorities in Oak Hill, West Virginia and asked them to do a welfare check on the girl. But before the West Virginia police could conduct that check, detectives in New York got in touch with Thomas and pulled him in for questioning. Thomas denied that he had anything to do with Brian's murder, saying that he had been at a local restaurant the night before and had arrived home sometime between maybe 10 or 10.10 10 p.m., which meant he would have been home when Brian was still alive and inside the Dynabraid factory. Thomas would admit to police that yes, he and Brian both did meet the same girl online, Jessie, and they had been squabbling over her. But Thomas said he would never hurt Brian. But it wasn't until investigators in New York heard back from police in West Virginia and tracked down additional cell phone data and spoke with Cindy Montgomery that they were able to piece together who had really killed Brian and why. At 1.33 a.m. on September 13th, 2006, so two days before Brian was killed, Jesse heard the ping of an incoming instant message. When she looked at her computer screen, she saw that it was from Thomas. It said, you're a whore and that's all you ever will be. For weeks, ever since Brian had told Thomas that he planned to drive to West Virginia to see Jesse in person, Thomas's messages to Jesse had become extremely abusive. Jesse had tried to calm him down to get him to become once again her sweet sexy marine sniper named Tommy, but it just wasn't working. And so now, seeing this new message come across, Jesse took up a new strategy. She began ignoring him. And this drove Thomas mad. A day later, on September 14th, Jesse heard the ping of yet another incoming message, asking her if she planned to have sex with one of her boyfriends that day. Again, Jesse just ignored him. A day after that, early on the morning of Friday, September 15th, the day Brian was killed, Thomas woke Jesse up with a phone call, screaming at her in an uncontrollable rage. She hung up on him. Thomas Montgomery had reached a mental tipping point. On one hand, he knew that he could never really have a real life with Jesse. He also knew that his jealousy and rage were getting out of control. But the same part of him that had written out that New Year's resolution slash manifesto back on January 2nd, 2006, felt that he still possessed somewhere inside the young marine sniper whom Jesse had loved and who represented to Thomas the best version of himself. And so on September 15th, after screaming at Jesse on the phone and hearing the click as she hung up on him, Thomas made up his mind. He had waited long enough for his transformation from middle-aged machinist with a wife and two daughters into that battle-hardened marine sniper who could and would defend what was his. That evening, Thomas told his wife, Cindy, that he was going to go out to dinner by himself. Once outside in his car, he looked in the back seat to make sure his supplies were all there. Then he turned on his car and drove to a fast food place near Dynabraid. After eating, Thomas left the restaurant and drove the short distance to Dynabraid. Entering the parking lot behind the factory, Thomas chose a parking space that was far away from the door where he knew Brian would exit. After his car was parked, Thomas climbed out of his vehicle. He was glad it was cloudy, and he was glad that the parking lot where he now stood was almost empty except for Brian's white pickup truck. Thomas finally finished eating his peach and dropped the pit onto the parking lot pavement. Now, as a marine sniper, Thomas had to get the timing of this mission exactly right. He needed to get close enough to the truck to take his kill shots before Brian had a chance to drive away, but he also had to let Brian get into the truck without giving away his own position. And on his way in for the kill, he needed to make a silent puncture with his knife in the back left tire. This was his insurance policy. In case Brian did see him, it would make it very difficult for him to escape. Just after 10.16 p.m., the factory door opened and Brian walked outside into the parking lot. Brian didn't even look up as he walked towards his truck. 
To Thomas, what he was about to do almost seemed too easy. As soon as Brian had climbed into the truck and closed the driver's side door, Thomas was there like a shadow. And a second later, he had fired three shots through the closed window. Even through the blood spatter on the inside of the car window, he saw the massive hole in Brian's neck and knew that he was dead or was definitely going to die. Backing away from the truck, Thomas quickly returned to his own car, not realizing that he had dropped one of his shell casings. On his drive back to his house, Brian hoped his wife and daughters would be asleep. That way, no one could contradict him when he said he'd gotten home that night before Brian had actually left the factory. But when police did interview Cindy a few days later, she would tell them that it was her recollection that her husband had not arrived home on the night of Brian's murder before 10.16 p.m. Cindy estimated that it was closer to 10.45 p.m. or later. And when police arrived at Dynabraid to question Thomas, he made a remark that instantly connected him in the minds of investigators to the peach pit they had found at the scene of Brian's murder. Thomas asked police if they could wait just a minute before questioning him so he could get the peaches he'd brought in for lunch out of his car so they wouldn't spoil in the sun. Although Thomas refused to give police a DNA sample, the police were able to pick up his DNA from a can of soda, and they found that it matched the DNA on the peach pit they'd found at the murder scene. A search of Thomas's house did not turn up a 30 caliber carbine rifle, but it did turn up an old photo of Thomas's gun cabinet that contained the exact same gun. Thomas's computer told investigators the rest of the story. In thousands of messages and emails to Jesse and Brian, coupled with his collection of Jesse's lingerie and other gifts, Thomas detailed his obsession with Jesse and his jealousy and growing hatred for Brian. Later, police would also discover the letter that Thomas had written that he kept locked in his toolkit at work. It was his New Year's resolution slash manifesto that described wanting to leave 46-year-old Thomas Montgomery behind and become instead his 18-year-old alter ego, Marine Sniper Tommy. On November 27, 2006, two months after Brian's death, police arrested Thomas and charged him with murder. And it was at this time that Thomas learned he was not the only person pretending to be someone else online. When West Virginia law enforcement arrived at Jessie's house to do that welfare check on her, her mother arrived at the door. When police told her that her daughter, Jessie, was in danger following the murder of a man she had likely been involved with online, the woman was shocked and told them that Jessie was not home. When police told her that they really needed to get in touch with her immediately and go get her in their own vehicles if necessary, the mother suddenly broke down and started crying and then told police that she really did have a daughter named Jessie. But that was not the Jessie they were looking for. She, the mother, a slightly overweight 46-year-old housewife with short brown hair, whose real name was Mary Sheeler, was the 17-year-old girl, tall, hot, blonde. It would turn out, for more than 16 months, Mary Sheeler had used her daughter's real identity to enter into multiple online relationships with men, sending them, just as she had sent Thomas and Brian, hundreds of pictures of the real Jesse, her daughter. When investigators asked her why she did this, Mary said she had joined Pogo to relax and kill time. After that, she enjoyed the drama and power and attention she got from manipulating the emotions of her many online admirers, none of whom she loved. In fact, she told investigators she was happily married to her husband of 23 years and was very devoted to her daughter, who had no idea any of this was happening and was off at college. But all that would change when the real 18-year-old Jessie discovered her own pictures and name all over the internet, along with details of how her own mother used her identity as bait for a catfishing scheme that left one man dead, one in prison, and two families in ruins. When police arrived at the jail and showed Thomas Montgomery a picture of the real tall, hot blonde, 46-year-old Mary Sheeler, the color from his face drained. Then, without saying a word, he turned around and faced the wall. He would eventually plead guilty and would be sentenced to 20 years in prison. There were no charges that could be brought against Mary Sheeler for catfishing, but her husband would divorce her and her daughter, Jessie, would sever all ties with her.
Thank you for taking the time to watch the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like, comment, and subscribe to the channel for more content. Your support means a lot to us and helps us create more videos that you'll love. We appreciate your feedback and would love to hear your thoughts on the video. What did you like about it? What could we improve? Your feedback will help us create better content in the future. If you're interested in seeing more videos like this, please subscribe to our channel. We post new videos every week, so you'll always have something new to watch. Once again, thank you for watching and supporting our channel. We hope to see you again soon. Smiling face.